For more than three centuries, Scotland has been part of the United Kingdom of Great Britain. But in September of this year, there is a vote that could change that. Scots will be asked a simple question. Should Scotland be an independent country? Joining us now for more on the campaigns for and against Scotland's independence and lessons learned from our own experience in Quebec. Charlie Jeffrey, he is professor of politics at the University of Edinburgh and Nicola McEwen, also a professor of politics at the University of Edinburgh. And we're happy to have you two folks on this side of the pond. Thanks for visiting us. Welcome. Great to be here. Okay, Nicola, why is this happening now? It's a very good question. I'll tell you why it's not happening, okay? Because there was no evidence of any groundswell of opinion in favor of this. There's no grievance that people are rallying around. We're having a referendum now because the SNP, the pro-independence party, won an election. So that created a political opportunity for it to push ahead with its mandate to hold a referendum on independence. Um, and that's why we're having it, purely that opportunity, not because of any massive uh, mobilization of support in favor of it. That doesn't mean it won't win. Um, it could still win because it has kick-started this whole debate about Scotland's place within the UK, within the Union, and there's an awful lot of conversations going on out there. So, uh, Charlie, you agree the Scottish National Party won this election and therefore it's opened a window and here we are? Uh, that's exactly right, but there, there, there is some fertile ground for it to build on, even though there is no popular mobilisation, as Nicola said, uh, because Scots, in their clear majority, are generally dissatisfied with the government they get from uh, the UK level uh, in London uh, and uh, Scots clearly want uh, more self-government. Uh, the question is how much more self-government? Should that be more powers for the Scottish Parliament within the UK or should it be the whole hog of, uh, of national independence? Nicola, do you know what an independent Scotland would look like? Well, that would depend on the negotiated settlement uh, for the Scottish National Party and government in Scotland just now, what it proposes is something very similar to what the Quebec uh, government proposed in the 1990s. It's independence with partnership. So it envisages a lot of continuities, a lot of things shared, like a shared currency, for example, or lots of shared institutions, lots of cooperation on public policies. Um, but that partnership needs a willing partner so it would very much depend on the response of the UK government and whether it was willing to cooperate and engage. If it's independence plus partnership, how independent is that really? Uh, that's the question that the UK government is, is asking the Scottish government. <coughs> uh, the UK government is, is trying to create the impression that this is not real uh, independence and if it's not real independence it's, it's not worth <coughs> having. Uh, it's quite an interesting reflection of the UK government's wider views uh, as well. Um, it, it suggests that uh, a Scottish government, uh, an independent Scotland sharing uh, a currency with the rest of the UK is a rather odd thing to do in the same way uh, that it thinks um, sharing a currency with the rest of the European Union is, is a rather odd thing to do. So there's a very different understanding of independence <coughs> from the UK government side compared to that which uh, the Scottish Government is, is putting forward. Uh, and it may well be, if we vote yes, that that willingness to partner in what the Scottish Government uh, would like to do uh, won't be there. So that's what a yes looks like. How about a no? Does a no mean status quo? No, there is no such thing as the status quo because there are already new powers coming regardless of what happens in, in the referendum in September. A law was passed a couple of years ago it will come into force in uh, two years' time. And even before that law is implemented to give a little bit more extra financial power, all three of the main political parties who are campaigning for a no vote have already promised more powers. They have felt the need to promise more uh, even before the new powers are introduced and we see how they go. Um, and that clearly they feel that they have been backed into a position where they have to offer more in order to secure a no victory. So a, as a bargaining tactic, it's already worked, right? The referendum has already worked in that respect. Fair to say? Uh, I think it's, it is pulling the pro-union parties, Labour, Conservative and Liberal Democrat, into a middle ground. And it's really important to, to remember that opinion in Scotland is not divided yes, no, 
independent status quo. It's really divided three ways. There's about a third of Scots who really would like independence, whatever happened. About a third of Scots for whom the status quo is far enough, thank you very much. And a third in the middle uh, who appear to want more, but not yet leave the UK. Uh, and these offers of more devolution from the, from the pro-union parties are an attempt to, to, to build support in that middle ground or to shore up their support in that middle ground. It's funny, the echoes of Quebec are so familiar here. It's amazing, that same one-third, one-third, yes. one-third. So yes. do I assume then that the campaign is all aimed, Nicola, at that one-third in the middle who are persuadable one way or another? Yes, in part. Uh, and it's not at all clear to me that the, the tactic of the, the, the no cam campaigning parties is really appealing to that group because the offer that they have presented is around uh, income tax devolution, essentially, um, to varying degrees. And it's quite technical. Um, it's not really capturing the imagination. And we don't really know what uh, that middle third wants, uh, ultimately. They want more. They, there seems to be a clear distinction between um, people favouring the Scottish Parliament having control over domestic policies. So including taxation, but including social welfare too. And that isn't in any of the, the packages on offer to any significant degree. Um, what they don't really want the Scottish Parliament to, to control is things like defence and foreign affairs, those big issues of state. Yeah. But it's not altogether clear that what is on offer will be enough to persuade them uh, it, certainly not uh, in, in full anyway. Now, if you're looking for clues as to how this was going to turn out, last time there was an election, 2011, the Scottish National Party got about 45% of the vote. So do they bank that right away and say, OK, we've got 45, all we've got to do is no. pick up another 5 plus and we win? That, that's not the way to look at Scottish politics. Um, the Scottish National Party was uh, very successful uh, in the last Scottish election not because of its um, desire to create an independent Scotland. Uh, it was successful in particular because it offered more credible government than uh, especially the Labour Party uh, in opposition. Uh, people in Scotland think that um, the SNP, and in particular its current leadership, which is generally very strong, offers uh, the best way of managing these relationships that Scotland has within the UK and getting the best deal for Scotland. This wasn't an election about independence. It was an election about how best to govern Scotland under current circumstances. You've both been very circumspect so far about not tipping your respective personal opinions on this. All very analytical. But let's find out. How are you voting? Uh, the referendum will be in September and it's a secret ballot and it will stay that way. <laughs> so you're not going to tell us? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. How are you voting? Uh, I, I also won't tell you. Um, and I'm in, a, in an interesting position as, a, as an Englishman uh, in Scotland, but with uh, the full uh, right to vote uh, in Scotland, uh, as any uh, Scottish residents with the, the, um, uh, the, the right national backgrounds uh, in the European Union or the Commonwealth have. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, you know, one of these cross-pressured voters that uh, um, is the subject of, of the two campaigns. So it's quite an interesting position uh, to be in. I, I feel that there's quite a, lot of, quite a lot of speaking to people like me. Well, the assumption is that you're a Brit and you, of course, would vote for Westminster at the end of the day. No? I, I spent a long time living in England deeply sceptical uh, about the centralisation of power in the Westminster Parliament, so I don't think you could necessarily call me a fan of Westminster. Okay, well, uh, let me follow up then with you on this, Nicola. Tell me a policy that Westminster has passed, the Parliament in London has passed, that you think, uh, okay, that flies in England okay, but for Scotland it's just not on. Um, well, there's a few different things. It, it's not necessarily the case that Scotland, in terms of its population, is very different from the population of England. So um, one of the current government's policies is around welfare reform. So curtailing social security benefits, unemployment benefits, that kind of thing. Doesn't fly um, in Scotland. It doesn't fly in Scotland in the same way that it doesn't fly in large parts of, parts of England. The differences, the political elite in Scotland is quite distinctive. The political culture in Scotland is quite distinctive. 
Um, so across the parties, um, even those parties who are in government at Westminster are a little bit uncomfortable uh, with this terrain too. So the political elite in Scotland is very different and that makes all issues and politics uh, different too. Another issue is around Trident uh, nuclear weapons. The UK's nuclear weapons are based in Scotland. There isn't really anywhere else for them to go uh, because of the deep water uh, loch where they are situated. Um, and that is an emotive issue for, for Scottish nationalism, as you can imagine. Um, Politically, in terms of public opinion, there isn't a great deal of difference in public opinion between um, Scot Scots and, and people in the rest of the UK, uh, but in terms of the political elite, that's an issue that matters. Let me ask you about the question that Quebecers got asked a lot, which is, okay, you want to go off on your own and be your own country? You really, at the end of the day, can't afford to do it. Your economy can't sustain itself without the motherland attached to you. Has that argument been used by the Brits in Scotland? And is it true? Can Scotland not survive on its own, economically speaking? Uh, this has been um, probably the most prominent battleground uh, in the independence debate, uh, whether people would be better off or worse off uh, if Scotland uh, had independence. Uh, and you'll not be surprised to hear that the two sides have very different uh, viewpoints. Um, the, the UK side will, will, will say that Scotland has uh, higher public spending per head uh, than uh, does England and how on earth would this be afforded and the Scottish Government says well actually if you include things like North Sea oil revenues uh, we produce more tax revenues per head and if you put these two things together actually in the last uh, period uh, Scotland has had a better fiscal uh, balance uh, than the UK as a whole. And then you get all of these issues projected forward, often into the distant future, with forecasts which have all sorts of assumptions around them, which are probably challengeable on, on both sides. Uh, a little while back, we had um, a, an attempt to turn this into real numbers per individual in Scotland. Uh, and the UK government was arguing that if Scotland voted yes, um, it would be £1,400 per head worse off. Uh, and the Scottish Government on the same day produced uh, a, a paper which suggested that actually uh, it'll be a thousand pounds better off uh, per person. <laughs> Who do you believe? Uh, I would probably split the difference and say that's about <laughs> right. <laughs> Both, I, I think, yeah. But I think it's important to, to note that very few people who are campaigning for a no would suggest that Scotland can't afford to do this, that it's too poor, that it wouldn't survive economically. And Scotland's not an economic basket case, it's a relatively wealthy part of Europe. Um, the issue, as Charlie was pointing out, revolves around would it be better off uh, within the Union or as an independent nation? And with all the, 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 the exposure to risks that independence might bring, uh, so it's this sense of, of greater risk economically, in terms of security, in all sorts of ways, that is a, 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 a theme, a recurring theme of the, the No campaign. But it's not without reason. I mean, again, our experience here in Canada back in 1976, when a separatist government won in Quebec for the first time, I mean, Montreal used to be the biggest, most powerful city in the country with lots of head offices of major corporations. Mm -hmm. It isn't anymore. Uh, that started an exodus that... Um, has helped make Toronto the most dynamic city in the country and the third biggest in North America now. So the, uh, let, me, let me follow up. I mean, the question persists. If independence comes to Scotland, is it possible that the Quebec situation could be replicated there? I, th I think it's a little bit different. I mean, who knows? We, I don't have a crystal ball any more than anybody else. Um, there were particular cultural and linguistic issues that came to play, I think, in Quebec at that time. Sure. Um, which are at least part of the explanation. No question. Um, and that's just not a feature of, of Scottish politics at all. Uh, we'd have to suggest that Quebec is not poor. Um, it's not, you know, it, yes, there are head office functions that moved, and yes, there is a westward drift anyway, um, but it's, it's not really an impoverished part of the country, really. Um, though doubtless, like everywhere, it will have its pockets of poverty. Um, and, and Scotland, similarly. I think there are issues around certain sectors. Scotland has a very 
strong financial services sector, which if Scotland became an independent country, arguably that financial services sector would be too big for a country of that size. Hmm. So you may see a bit of a uh, shift southwards um, in, in that respect. The other difference is uh, the European Union dimension. Um, the EU membership has come up as a recurring issue, um, but I think uh, certainly the academic community uh, has a fairly broad consensus um, that although there is no precedent within Europe for um, a member state splitting in two and uh, both continuing to be members, um, the general view is that Scotland would be a member of the European Union through some route. And that does provide an extra degree of protection, um, a, an extra market for these organisations to operate in. Okay, but Charlie, I'm going to be, a, again, I'm going to be the sceptic on this because that's part of the job. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, Americans uh, in high positions of government once said to Quebec, you know, if you want to leave, don't assume that you're going to be part of the North American Free Trade Agreement, right? If you guys are out, I mean, all bets are off. Has anybody said that to Scotland? Well, we have had one or two prominent Americans uh, make, uh, make comments uh, recently in the form of uh, President Obama and, uh, and Hillary Clinton, both saying in a, in a relatively mild way, we'd really rather Scotland uh, stayed within, within the UK. Uh, and we've also heard uh, comments from senior figures uh, in Europe. Um, the President of the European Commission has expressed some scepticism about whether Scotland would, uh, would be easily inside the European Union. And uh, other, other countries with similar pro-independence movements uh, have uh, sensitivities, and the Spanish Prime Minister has expressed some of those uh, sensitivities. Because he's got his own separatist problem, doesn't he? He, he does. Uh, yeah. Catalonia would like to have uh, a referendum a couple of months after the Scottish mm -hmm. one, no doubt hoping that Scotland says yes to uh, give, give further impetus uh, there. But these things can backfire, can't they? I mean, if you, if you get too many outsiders telling you what you should do... Yeah. Well, I, 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 it was very, very striking when, when Obama uh, and, and Clinton uh, made their comments because this was hailed as, uh, as, a, as a really, really significant thing on the no side uh, of the debate, especially uh, the UK government end and, and media commentary in, in London. As far as I could see in Scotland, it had very, very little effect. <laughs> No, no coattails on those comments, eh? No. Okay. Uh, you did mention the uh, North Sea oil fields not too long ago, and I do want to pick up on that angle and, and control room if we can. Let's bring up the map of the oil fields in the North Sea and show everybody what we're talking about here because this, of course, potentially represents um, a huge economic salvation to a future independent mm -hmm. Scotland. Uh, Nicola, tell us what the fight's over and who would have claim to all of that oil. Well, interestingly, they don't really fight about ownership, at least not at the moment. The, the argument is about how much it's worth. Um, and the different forecasts of both sides are really down to the way in which they project the value of North Sea oil. Um, the assumption is that around about 90% of the oil and gas reserves in the North Sea would go to Scotland. Um, and that hasn't really been challenged within the debate by mm -hmm. the UK government. And that's a very interesting, because there are other ways to calculate it. Mm -hmm. um, potentially, one might argue that you do it not in terms of geography and equidistance from land, but you do it in terms of population share, and which would clearly create a very different uh, picture. But, but nobody, has done, nobody has oh. done that. And it's, it seemed to be accepted that the oil would belong to Scotland in that case. And Charlie, if that is in fact the case, uh, is it a huge boost to the yes side? Um, it, it's one of the things that helps the economic arguments on the yes side stack up. Uh, I said earlier that, that Scotland spends more per head uh, than England, uh, and that if you include uh, North Sea oil tax revenues, it raises more per head. If you didn't have those North Sea uh, revenues, the, the numbers wouldn't stack up so easily. So it's, it's an absolutely fundamental part of the economic argument uh, on the yes side. We talked about outside voices and how influential they either will or won't be. Here's Sweden's foreign minister, whom we didn't mention, but this is Carl Bildt, who was the United Nations Special Envoy to the Balkans 
between 1999 and 2001, so he is not unfamiliar sure. with parts of the world that have broken and smithered, uh, into smithereens and um, the, the resulting calamity that uh, ensued in that part of the world. He said this to the Financial Times recently, I think it's going to have far more profound implications than people think. The balkanization, his word, the balkanization of the British Isles is something we are not looking forward to. Is that a fair characterization of what potentially could happen here? I don't think it is, no. Um, and what's interesting is we've had uh, numerous world leaders and um, senior figures on the world stage make interventions recently. This week, um, we had the a visit from, to, to the UK from the Chinese Premier, who similarly made uh, an intervention that he would prefer the United Kingdom to remain united. Mm. Um, no self-interest there, I'm sure. <laughs> in, 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 indeed, but these comments and interventions don't really appear to be having an impact, as Charlie said, and could potentially backfire because there is a sense in which they are the result of a certain degree of lobbying from the diplomatic service mm -hmm. um, to, to try and encourage people to intervene. Now, that may or may not be the case, but if that's a perception that's generated, then there is a potential that it, that it backfires. I think there's a broader point here as well. Perhaps if it, if it had stopped with Obama, then that might have had a, a bigger impact than if there's a succession of, of, of voices, then, then the, the effect might be to think, well, this is our decision. They're this is a democratic here, right? process. And the, the idea of popular sovereignty is very powerful in Scottish politics, and people absolutely believe they have the right to make the decision. Um, so th th there are risks of that backfiring too. It's not just political figures. We also had uh, David Bowie uh, make an <laughs> intervention to say, uh, Scotland, stay with us. So you can't get much bigger than Obama and Bowie, and it doesn't well, appear to have made, you, made an impact so How far. about James Bond? You can get bigger than Bowie and Obama ah, if you well, go to Sean Connery. Except he would do it the other way around, because exactly. Sean Connery is a supporter of the Scottish National Party and a supporter of Scottish independence, though has had quite a low yeah, profile. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Let's... Uh, it's actually, you, you prompted a, a thought in my head here on whether or not this campaign is being fought more on intellectual or on, uh, on an appeal to the heartstrings. Which way is the campaign going? Well, we've had such an emphasis on economic issues, mm -hmm. uh, such an emphasis on big themes like currency and uncertainty about currency, and then this attempt more recently to translate the economic implications into, into pounds in your pocket or, or not in your pocket, as, as the case may be. So it's been, it's been a rather materialistic uh, debate. And I, I think that's possibly a, a little bit surprising. We might have uh, imagined that there would be uh, a rather more em emotional element mm, uh, to it. Um, but that hasn't been the case. We, we have seen quite a bit of emotion um, given out, but it's, it's largely been online, uh, where some of the, the, the commentary on both sides, but probably more on the, on the pro-yes side, has been uh, vigorous uh, to uh, a, a very strong degree and, and has, has produced quite a bit of controversy, and probably damaging uh, the yes side uh, by being so, so, so rude and nasty to people who've come out as, uh, as supporters of, of the no side. Generally speaking, the public debate has focused on economic issues. So an appeal to the head, perhaps eventually an appeal to the heart. How about, Nicola, an appeal to fear? Has that happened yet? Uh, yes. Um, by whom? Cer certainly by um, the, the no side, which is officially called the better together side. Um, so a, f a fear of a loss of power, a loss of influence, um, exposure to risk, so lots of talks about risk um, of independence. With positive messages alongside that, um, there's a, th a recurring theme in a lot of political speeches about devolution and um, providing the best of both worlds. So you have some autonomy and you have the protection of being part of a larger state. Um, there is some attempt to try to appeal to feelings of solidarity, and particularly from uh, the Labour Party, which is still a significant political party in Scotland, although it's in opposition um, in the UK at, at the moment. That's much more difficult uh, an appeal to make from opposition. Um, 
And the interesting thing is that British identity in Scotland is not terribly strong. So people primarily feel Scottish more than they feel British. There are very few people who will tell us in surveys that they feel British first and Scottish second. Mm. And that might be part of the explanation for this um, lack of a sort of embracing of, of Britishness. It has been there a little bit, particularly around the time of the Olympics and the, the feeling of success that the Olympic spirit brought, but um, it's, it's less, less evident now. But I know, Charlie, in 1995, the government of Canada made it clear, and I'm not, I wouldn't call this fear-mongering, it was just simply telling it like it was, if Quebec, you want to separate, you can't have our passport, you can't have our currency, mm -hmm. you can't elect members to parliament uh, in Ottawa, and yet I think there were Quebecers who thought they were going to be allowed to continue to do all three of those things. So is it fear-mongering to have the, uh, and I don't know that this has happened, but to those who stand for the no side, for them to remind Scots, you're not going to send people to Westminster, and you know maybe you can't have the currency, and maybe you can't have the passport too, if you want to leave. Well, well, clearly um, there's no expectation that if Scotland goes independent, there, there would be representation at Westminster. Um, uh, Alex Salmond, the First Minister, has been clear that uh, of all of the, th the things that the Scotland shares with the rest of the UK, that is the thing that independence would end, the, mm. the parliamentary uh, union. The UK government has only been explicit uh, around currency union uh, among these various shared arrangements that the Scottish government has proposed. Uh, it's been skeptical about many of the others and says, well, not sure this could happen and it would be very difficult and it might not be in our interests. There's a big debate uh, about whether this is, is real and fundamental and non-negotiable or whether it's a pre-negotiation tactic. Right. The Scottish government insists that it is a tactic. One or two people normally off record uh, in, in and close to the UK government have suggested that actually there may be things that could be traded uh, on both sides uh, so as to produce an outcome which might, in the end, deliver some of what the Scottish Government uh, would like. Mm. Uh, not least around nuclear weapons, which we mentioned earlier. Um, there isn't really anywhere else that they could be moved to. Um, uh, the, the only facilities, uh, and, and it costs a lot, and it takes a lot of time to build them, yeah. uh, the only facilities available currently uh, are in Scotland. Now, would it be beyond the, the, the wit of the two governments after a yes vote to think, well, OK, nuclear weapons, currency union, might a deal be possible? Um, we can't know that until, uh, until and unless it happens. Right. Tell me the significance of this. I, if memory serves, in uh, 1980 and in 1995, when Quebec had its two referenda, you had to be 18 to vote. You have extended the vote in Scotland to 16 and 17 year olds as well. Mm -hmm. Is that significant? It's, well, it's significant in that it's, it's new, it's, it's um, innovative, um, but it won't have a significant bearing on the result. Uh, or if it does, the opinion polls are suggesting just now that 16, 17 year olds are disproportionately inclined to vote no. That's what I'm wondering. Um, then, then yes. Yeah. Um, which was a bit of a surprise um, when the polls first started to reveal that because it used to be the case that younger voters were more um, nationalist, more mm -hmm. pro-independence than, than others. Um, that may not hold all the way through the campaign. There's a lot of grassroots mobilisation uh, taking place on the yes side, more so than on the no side. Um, so opinion may shift there. Um, but I don't think it was an innovation that was purely strategic on the part of the Scottish National Party. That party has long favoured votes at 16. In Scotland, legally, you're an adult at age 16. I so you can, you can get married, you can serve your country in war. So there was a principled um, view that you should be able to decide the future of the country that will be years more than more than anyone else gotcha. in a way. Right. Uh, a few minutes left, let's touch on a couple of more things. Charlie, how familiar are people in Scotland with the Quebec precedent? Do they know of it? I would have to say that most Scots uh, are, are probably at best vaguely aware uh, that Quebec has had uh, a similar debate twice around, around the two referendums. Um, 
they might be aware, since that Quebec is still in Canada, that uh, um, uh, Quebec's secession didn't happen. But but it, it's not very prominent, and it's it's been really striking uh, how how the yes side has not appealed to solidarity with pro-independence mm -hmm. movements uh, elsewhere. Uh, in fact, there's there's been a bit of an attempt to keep them at arm's length. You know, we don't want to be seen. Uh, to be annoying the Spanish central government because we'd like to be in the U European Union and that wouldn't be, be in, in, in the Scottish government's interests. Uh, and uh, the Quebec Prime Minister, um, uh, the then Prime Minister, Pauline Marois, uh, came over um, and I think probably expected uh, some, some fanfare around her visit, but it was extraordinarily low-key. There was mm. an attempt to keep equivalent situations in other places out of the Scottish debate. Mm. Agree? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and, and for the SNP, they see Scotland as more like Denmark or Norway. This is a, this is a European nation state in waiting. Hmm. Um, and so they have not uh, sought uh, common cause uh, with even the Catalans um, and, and the Quebecers as well. If, as it happened twice in Quebec, the Scottish referendum fails to get a yes vote, what does that mean for the separatist movement going forward? It's still um, very popular as a government. The Scottish National Party is a popular government. It, unless things change significantly, it will probably be re-elected re in a couple of years regardless. And the First Minister has said that this would be a once-in-a-generation opportunity. Um, I'm not entirely sure that it would be um, if circumstances change within the UK, which changes the nature of union uh, in particular if the UK has a referendum on its future within the European Union and votes to withdraw from the EU, then that creates an opportunity, a catalyst, uh, for returning to this much more quickly than a whole generation away. I mean, that's what they say in Canada too, is that the separatists are down for now, but you can never count them out. This issue does tend to come back on a cyclical basis once every generation or generation and a half. Same thinking in Scotland? Well, I think we see that uh, in, in the continuing pressure for, for more devolution. Um, we uh, have had our second uh, Scotland Act, uh, the first one establishing the Parliament uh, uh, back in 1999. We had a Scotland Act 2012, which was a response to the SNP's first election victory in 2007 when it established a minority government. That prompted the, uh, the pro-union parties to have a debate, and the outcome of that was... Scotland Act 2012, which um, added some more powers. And now we're seeing that, that the pull of the, the Scottish National Party with that commitment to independence is taking the pro-union parties uh, further to offer more devolution. <laughs> that pull is not going to go away. Fascinating echoes from our own history, if you don't mind my observing. We thank Charlie Jeffrey and Nicola McEwen for coming over here. And not only did I... Not only did I like what I learned, but I love the sound of this conversation, I must say. You guys have the, the best accents anywhere. Anyway, thank you so much to you both. You're thank welcome. you very much. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.